I, I thought I would show the latest technology for looking at the very large number of slides in a very short period of time. <laughs> yes, well, the, what you're looking at here is a sort of uh, more or less representative sample of what my program has been up to. Um, not up to date. I, I think this ends at around 1985. So we're only talking about the first 20 years or so. And I don't pretend you have the first idea what you just saw, but we'll, we'll be looking at that all in, in a moment. Um, I really, apart from um, acknowledging my daughter's um, influence on my professional life, um, I also wanted to show that there probably was, has been some reason why um, a lot of people have um, cited my program Aaron as being an extraordinarily creative program. And of course, if you judge creativity simply in terms of the number of, I would like to think, first-rate artworks that the program can produce, then that would seem to be a perfectly reasonable conclusion. Aaron is um, a, a very creative program. Uh, for myself, however, I've, I've spent the last 10 years um, in this increasingly um, loud dialogue about machine creativity, um, expressing my own opinion, which is that Aaron is not creative at all. Um, and the, the reason that I've never believed the program is creative is that I, I, I believe that a, a genuine act of creativity has to leave the individual in a different position from where he or she or it started. You have to, a creative act changes your, your standpoint, changes your understanding. Um, of what you're doing and I've never been able to um, persuade Aaron to change anything about what it did. So is there no creativity here? Yes, sure there's creativity here but I've assigned, I assign the creativity to uh, the peculiar compendium of programmer and program. Aaron and I between us have done things that neither Aaron could do on its own nor I could do on my own. Okay, so we're already um, limiting limiting what we understand by what I understand by creativity, or perhaps more reasonably uh, distinguishing between cap creativity with a small c um, and creativity with a big c. And if we do that, then I wanted to make it perfectly clear at the outset that I'm interested in creativity with a big C. Now, after 10 years um, of discourse on machine creativity, along pops this new word that I've never heard um, before this, um, an the announcement for this conference, um, inspiration. Nobody in my experience in the art world would ever use a word like inspiration. Much too romantic, much too um, fluffy. Um, on the other hand, I'm prepared to recognize that talking about inspiration in a conference like this implies that we can have a discourse not only about what happens, in the act of creativity, but why it happened in the first place. What caused something to happen? So I'm going, if I can persuade my machine to come back to life here. And apparently, I, oh there we go. And if I can, if I can just get to the other program. See, my daughter really is right. Um, <laughs> I want to get to my. No, I don't want that. I, what I want. What are we doing? <laughs> We're unplugging it and plugging it back in. 
I don't have a cursor. Where's my cursor? Oh, there we go. No, I don't there want that go. either. Okay. I want... Yeah. Why is it not responding? Can I see for a sec? I'm, I'm looking for Keynote. Um, keynote should be around here somewhere. Next one. Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start right at the beginning here and try to say something about why I got involved in computing in the first place. I, I met my first computer in 1968, I think it was, when I came to the United States from London. Um, and I, I was in a singularly fortunate position. Like I haven't realized until recently how important this was for me. Um, I was one of the only people around who, at the age of 40, had already established a position in relation to art making. If you look at the history of all of the other people who were there at the beginning, um, most of them, well, certainly most of them in Germany, who were some of the earliest proponents, they were all actually physicists who discovered that they could make pictures. Um, shortly afterwards, there was a generation of people for whom computing was their first experience of art making. They had no position um, in relation to art before they came to the modern media. And I, I turn out finally to be one of the only people um, it's almost impossible to say. One can hardly believe this um, when you say it out loud. One of the only people in the world who actually brought a, a full active career into computing at the time when it could be picked up and it happened. What that meant in practical terms and in terms of this inspiration stuff that we might be talking about um, is that I brought a whole cartload of things with me into computing. I didn't see computing as a new game to be played with new rules uh, and new goals and new everything else. What I saw was a way of solving problems that I brought with me that I hadn't been able to solve before. And consequently, the first question I asked myself once, once I found that I was able to do something with these curious machines. The first question I asked myself reflected um, a problem that had been with me right through my professional life. How is it um, I can make some dirty marks on a piece of paper and you will say, that's a face? Right? What, what is the mechanism between the marks one makes on a flat surface and the interpretation that the audience brings to it. So stripping that, all that down, I found myself asking this fundamental question. What is the minimum configuration under which a set of marks will function as an image? Hmm? Now, obviously, if you think about the English language, I'm obviously not the only person um, who is interested in the transposition from something that is there to something that is not there. Think the number of words we have. Image, representation, uh, sign, symbol. You could go on 20 or 30 different terms, all of which imply um, a spread between what one does over here and what that implies about something over there. Okay. So there I was. Uh, th this was actually the second thing I should have said about my contact with computing. Uh, the first was simply I found that I had acquired a new way of using my brain. I learned programming in a big hurry. I think it was something, it was probably Fortran at that point, heaven help us. But the, you know, 
I was quite suddenly, I, I used to say I felt like somebody, like an athlete who had been out of training for a long time and suddenly found himself back in form. A actually, looking back now, it was more than that. It wasn't just that I found my brain being used in a way that it hadn't been used in the studio. It was that it was being used in a different kind of way. I was learning a new way to use my own mental resources, um, quite unlike um, the way I used them when I was painting. That becomes clearer, as, as I'll explain a little later, that becomes clear, much clearer a little later on. As to what I was doing with the computer, um, as you'll see from this slide, my first impulse was to say, well, um, the first thing I've got to do is to persuade the audience that uh, this, these marks were produced by a cognitive system not unlike his or her own cognitive system. So the, the first drawings m made by the program uh, were really made to emphasize, uh, even uh, thinking back now, even to illustrate the difference between what I regarded as various cognitive primitives, the difference between open forms and closed forms, the difference between inside and outside, uh, markings on a surface and markings inside a mark that stands as a surface, stuff like that. And my, my inclination at that point was um, to think, well, this is a good track to be on, it seems to be working, because all I have to do now is to uncover more and more of what I th thought of as cognitive primitives, and the, pe the images will become more and more complex as time goes on, um, and that means I'll be able to go on producing art forever. Right? Um, producing art forever, of course, is the goal. Perhaps I should pause there and make a point, um, a very important point. If you think of art making as dumping, um, producing and dumping these marvellous things into the world, uh, the, con the contents of your brain are now externalised and put out there for people to admire, then you've got the wrong idea. Um, that's part of the notion of self-expression um, that has been common in the culture for the last 50, 100 years. In fact, let me propose that the artist externalises what's in his head, not to express it, but to find out what it is. We don't know what we're thinking until we actually find some way of taking it out and putting it out there in the real world. Consequently, the, the idea that um, what I said just now, um, being able to go on and produce art forever, it implies a kind of not one magnificent thing after another. It implies an ongoing process and what we regard as creativity um, implies an ongoing process um, of getting from one stage of understanding what's in your head to the next stage. So that, that was my state of mind um, when, when I started this program and I proved to be quite wrong. Um, over, over the course of eight or ten years the program and I produced quite a lot of work together um, this was an exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Art. Um, as you see, the, the whole of the back wall is um, a damn great, I think like a 110 foot painting made from Aaron's drawings, while in the foreground um, Aaron is actually producing new drawings on the floor. That's, that's the little turtle um, that was making the drawings under computer control. Um, but I was not, in fact, finding any more cognitive primitives. And I found myself at the end of ten years um, 
in some, something of a frustrated state, um, thinking, well, I, I, I think I made a mistake there. I think um, the mar remarkable thing about the cognitive system is not that it's got 100,000 different primitives. It's that it's got very few primitives that are combined together in different ways in relation to an external world. And here I'd written a program um, that was uh, proposed to model the creative, the, the cognitive system, but it was doing, doing it in a vacuum. There wasn't an external world. And my whole way of thinking about the thing changed, and I started thinking, well, I've got to give the program some knowledge of the outside world. Um, the most complex thing I can think about in the outside world is the human figure. Why, why don't we start with that? And the, the program then produced, ooh, for over a number of years, um, a series of images, starting off with a curious kind of two and a half dimensional uh, rendering of the figure, finally taking on um, fully three dimensional um, knowledge base about the figure. Not, a, not what it looked like so much as how it moved, how it behaved. Because the body can do all kinds of screwy things that we don't actually do in real life. Um, so there has to be some knowledge about what actually, ha not what can happen, but what actually happens. All that is encoded and the uh, program was able to provide um, some quite, uh, what shall I say, lifelike um, images. I, I did one show at the Computer Museum in Boston um, and one day somebody came in, had just flown in from Seattle because I, I don't think he came to Boston just for that, but he said he'd been watching television um, a broadcast about the program on television and the, 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 the machine had done a portrait of him uh, <laughs> a couple of days before. But it, w it was very common for us to sort of break for lunch and go and find somebody um, in the cafeteria um, whom the program had apparently just drawn. So a lot, lot of things going on, a lot of exhibiting going on, um, a lot of subplots working themselves out. One of the dominant ones of which was um, the need to actually exhibit what I was doing as an artist, to exhibit what all this was about. And in order to do that, I found myself on this sort of curious engineering sidetrack where I started building machines, drawing machines in the first place. I started, when I, I started building these things, I was so naive, I, I didn't even know that you could buy parts out of catalogues. Uh, um, and I, I was making the parts myself. Um, I didn't, this, this thing is the mind of its own. You put, you just, well, yeah. That, that was in fact the last machine I built. It was a large painting machine. Um, which consisted of a, a robot arm being carried around on an XY plotter um, with a row of different colored bottles ink, of ink in the background. Th that, that's now a permanent exhibit in the um, Computer History Museum down the road in Mountain View. Um, and it's, it's the last one I did, last machine I built because well, I, you know, I, I used to spend a lot of time in the museums talking to people. I, I always felt that if I was presenting them with something, they had no way of figuring out for themselves what was going on. I should be there to help. Um, but it, it, with this one, I found that people were watching it doing the painting, and then they would watch it while it washed out its cup before mixing a new color, and it would wash out its brush before doing a new bit of painting. 
Um, and they would say, oh, he's, he's doing housework. It must be a robot. It's a robot. And I'd say, no, 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 no. It's just a machine. It's, you know, it's no more a robot than your desktop printer. Just a little more complicated. Um, but I, I thought finally I was sending the wrong message. And I stopped building machines. But so, so life went on. We, we, we're covering now um, a, a period of, uh, actually, from the time I started until fairly recently, a period of about 40 years. And as you see, the work is changing. But my attitudes are changing also. Most of this period, um, during most of this period, I was driven by the notion of the machine as an autonomous entity. But I had this notion in my mind um, that the machine didn't need an operator. It could continue to develop itself. Um, and it would, in fact, be an autonomous artist. I never got to that point. Um, moreover, I started to realize, compared to the human mind in the act of doing something as complicated and curious as art making, the computer program is this piddlingly small, uncomplicated um, little entity. We're not within light years of having a computer, even a very smart computer that can do things that human beings cannot do. We're, we're miles and miles away from that computer being capable of the subtleties um, of the human mind engaged in poetry or literature or art making or music. And my attitude changed in this way, that rather than seeing the, the program as an independent entity um, th from which I would increasingly depart. I started to see it much more as a collaborator um, that could do things I couldn't do um, and I would do things that it couldn't do. And what you're seeing here um, is moderately recently recent work I think these last two images were done like two or three years ago. Um, and in that state of mind, I finally came back to thinking, wait, I, I've got to come, I really want to come back to this original problem that had never really been solved properly. What is the minimum configuration, and I do mean minimum configuration, under which a set of marks will function as an image. Well, what's the simplest thing you can say about something drawing? It's um, a, you know, a drawing entity, the point of a pencil, whatever, that is going to move. It's going to draw these little vectors. You, you can imagine it to be um, the, the turtle um, that I used previously. Actually, now it's, it's simply a theoretical entity, but it's, it's going to draw these little vectors, but rather like the, 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 the small wheels of the turtle, um, it's not going to be very accurate. It's, not, it's almost never going to draw a, a straight series of vectors all in the same direction. It's going to, there'll be some variation wheel slippage, um, in the case of the human hand, arthritis, um, and any of the things that make the difference between a freehand line and a ruled line. And in this case, it meant that the, sometimes it would diverge slightly, veer to the right, um, sometimes it would veer slightly to the left, and if it kept on veering within the same, you know, not too much one way or the other, and not too much in one direction rather than another, it would produce something more or less like a straight line. Um, on the other hand, I think I've lost a slide here somewhere. On the other hand, if it... 
No, I have lost it. Never mind. You can imagine. Um, if, if it preponderantly veered to one side, then you would start getting a curve forming, either, either a clockwise curve or a, a, a count. I don't know if I can point them back here, but you can see what the curves might look like. And they might be anything from these large sweeping things to these, depending upon um, how much it could diverge from, from one little vector to the next. On the other hand, here are examples of more or less straight lines. Now, does that give minimum conditions? No, obviously it doesn't. For, for starters, uh, what you're looking at now is a long way from merely um, doing little curves and little straight lines. Um, for one thing, it's fairly obvious that the program is actually um, repeating itself. When, when it does one curve, it then immediately goes and does another one. So it must know what it's... We, our little turtle now has acquired a little brain and it does in fact know what it's doing at least one stage back. When, when it does one straight line, it can then go back and do another straight line. But I'm already getting ahead of myself because in fact, um, if nothing else was at stake, what I would get would be, you know, what I told you about would be a, a formula for a big mess. Um, it would go on drawing all over what it had been doing um, before and you get something like that happening. So that, that led in, in fact to another level of control, an essential level of control, um, that isn't actually embodied in the turtle or the, the drawing entity itself. The, it's, you now have to regard the turtle as something like a snail that leaves a trail behind it and the trail, in drawing some new stuff, the snail, snail, turtle, entity, creature may not cross a trail that's already there. So now, now we have a level of control um, that's embodied in the, as it were, in the ground, the picture plane itself. It, is keeping track of what is actually being done on the surface. So now when you, you get back, something rather interesting is happening because you're going to generate a lot of these little T-junctions where the line has gone so far and is then stopped by um, a line that is already there. And these C-junctions are extremely important because in any kind of representation um, you will find that they actually um, invoke the notion of um, overlap. That you read them as being something going behind something else. And no nothing is more important in trying to conjure a, a three-dimensional world than the notion of occlusion. So now we're getting a, a free gift um, in the program. It's not th this business of having the ground um, keep a record of the marks that are there, preventing lines going over the marks that are there, um, is not only given, is not only generating the sense that the drawing <coughs> entity knows what it's doing, which in that sense it does, but it also introduces this uh, very primitive notion that there's some reference being made to an external world. Okay. Now at, at that point, um, I'm in a domain where, and I think this is important, um, I hardly know what to say because it's what I'm working on right now. I have not yet reached, we, ha we have not yet reached this minimum configuration where the thing is going to function as an image. In order to do that, the program is now re 
really rather, rather <laughs> hard to say. He's tightly controlled on fuzzy notion of um, clumping, clustering. The, the program now has to be smart enough um, when it's placing all of these little primitive curves and straight lines, um, it has to know that some of them form a group, some of them form a different group, some of them form a different group. And those clusters are, in fact, and the relationship of those clusters are um, what the thing is referring to. It's difficult to talk about it. As I say, uh, as I said at the beginning, making art is not a question of taking a ready-made thought and shoving it out into the real world. It's a question of trying to understand what you have in your head. And when I talk about clustering, we, we're really talking about very ill-defined notions that we hardly ever think about. Like, what do you, if I say, put it over there, what do I mean exactly by over there? We don't, I don't even know what kind of mark is going to be produced by the, um, by, by the mark-making entity, much less where I should put it. So the clustering is a way of finding its way into a kind of formalism that I can use. I can use, that is to say, um, in making painting. And ag again, um, one of the um, really badly defined um, criteria I have for how the thing functions is um, that I want the drawings to be paintable. Yeah, well, lots of luck. I, mean, I don't even know what I mean when I say paintable. And in, in fact, to, you know, to give you some idea, we, we print up the drawings on canvas and I should think for every one painting that I actually managed to do, there are probably two or three paintings that never get finished because I can never understand um, what the drawing, uh, what I should do in relation to the drawing. So it sounds dreadful when I say it, but in, in point of fact, it points to what I've said now twice already. The point is not um, to throw out all these marvelous, um, precious things in the world. It's a matter of finding out what you have in your head and moving forward. So there we are. I, th I think that's probably as far as I can go. Um, the, I mean, it's just, or put it slightly differently, this is as far as I have gone. Um, these, these two paintings, the last two paintings I'm showing you here, um, were literally finished uh, just in time um, to label them night, f put, put last year's date on them instead of this year's date. Um, so what comes next, you won't know until um, I've gone through it. But I, I, the, what a vague way of ending. Let, let, <laughs> let's, let's brighten it up by saying maybe I could answer some questions. <laughs> Um, have you thought about, uh, I saw an exhibition a couple of weeks ago where a guy put on an EEG cap, which is now readily available to the general public, and, and um, allowed a computer to interpret his emotional state as read by this. Have you thought about applying that to sort of, you know, you were talking about teaching the computer and, and, and this, this difference between spitting something out and spitting it out so you can understand it. Have you? Have you thought about giving the computer a brain to work with that it could maybe try to interpret? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, the, the day may come. Um, I, from what I can tell from at least the popular literature, um, we know there's stuff going on in there, but nobody's found very many connections between individual thought processes or, no, that's not quite right. Um, between, I mean, 
between the model of the world, including us, which we have in our brain, uh, which has been formed up over decades, whatever, um, and what one can actually see with these devices. I, I do think it's quite, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not proposing this, and I don't, don't think I'd volunteer either. I, th I think the day may come, let me start in a slightly different place. One of the interesting things I've noticed in this last round of work, and th this is quite surprising because it was never like this before, um, I can't paint and program at the same time. I find I start painting, and as long as I'm painting for whatever it is, a week, two weeks, I never even switch on my computer. Then there's something I need to do for the next stage of the program, and for as long as I'm working on it in the program, I don't even bother to go into my studio. And I'm realizing that what's happening is that I said at the beginning that what brought me into computing in the first place was the awareness that there was, you know, a, a set of an expertise, a special part of the brain that was functioning in a certain kind of way. That's become very, very clear now. I've got two, two entities there that are collaborating with each other. It's no longer a question of me collaborating with the program. It's a question of the me that is the expert on pain collaborating with the other me that is the expert on programming. Mm. They do talk to each other, but they won't both do their jobs at the same time. Now having said that, I, I think it's entirely possible that at some time in the next few decades, we will find ourselves being given um, implants that bring computing power directly into our brain so that we can access abilities that we do not normally carry around with us. But I don't, I don't see myself volunteering for it. <laughs> That's a good, good question. I, I mean, does the world really need much more art? I don't know. Um, in certain parts of the art world, there are some people who are paying obscene amounts of money to get more of it. Um, but uh, you know, what, what are we what are we talking about here? The, Do, do, we, do we want a culture without literature? Do we want a culture without music? I mean, you're talking about... If you, you, you know, you, you're at a cognitive science conference, you're probably thinking, we need more cognitive science conference. Uh, more cognitive science, if not more cognitive science conferences. Um, but in point of fact, if you look back over history, my part of the game occupies much more space culturally. You know, think back, how, how many scientists can you think of in Leonardo's time? Can anybody think of a single scientist or mathematician? I'm going to start saying names from the arts and see if you can catch up. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Brunelleschi, Alberti, Donatello. Do I need to continue? Can anybody think of one mathematician? You should think of one mathematician. Surely Fibonacci. Uh, the 19th century, well, we, we all know about one or two scientists, but impressionists, you can think. 
sculptors, architects. I, I live in, in the part of the world that in a sense defines what? The finer parts of the color? I, I don't know. I, at, at the moment, the, for, me, for me personally, making objects, making paintings, is a way of doing what I was just talking about. It's a way of getting at what, trying to understand what's happening up there. Once they're out in the real world, yes, they do have a place, and they do make life more pleasant, mm -hmm. and they are some of the things we measure culture by. So, in the context of uh, neurobiology, the way that you're describing uh, art almost makes it sound like you believe it's a it's an exercise in, in, in rational thought versus what I would what I would presume was sort of emotional thought. You know, self-expression is an emotional thing derived as you know, uh, drawing on memory and, and feeling rather than judgment. And So, uh, uh, can okay. you repeat that? Depends right? on what you're saying. So my, my question is... No, my, my, it's not, not your question. Nothing wrong with your question. It's my hearing that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is your question? Uh, my question is, it, it sounds like he's describing art as if it's more of a, a rational process versus an emotional process. So it's a in, in the context of neurobiology, uh, I mean, my, my assumption is always say that art you know, comes from one's individual memory and, and feelings and, and we're expressing that on a piece of canvas. Mm -hmm. But but uh, what we're hearing it almost sounds like it's a, it's a rational thing, a logical process. I'm trying to understand what's in my mind and I put it on there so I can visualize it. No, uh, you know, I I just finished the talk by saying um, I can't tell you what I can't really tell you in very precise terms what I'm doing because it's what I'm doing now and I'm trying to find out what it is. Um, no, of, of course the individual, um, the individual has his or her own history of experience, feelings, uh, views of life, whatever. Um, we're trying to understand what those things are. It's, it's not like they come in a grad bag and now, oh, I know who I am and I'm going to externalize it. I, I, I used to know somebody when I was in art school um, who thought, thought of himself as an expressionist because when something really dreadful happened in his life, oh boy, now I can really make art. Um, <laughs> The, the, the problem is if you the, the problem is if the individual thinks that that stuff is already well formed and can be brought out right and it almost never is well formed it has to be dragged out and it has to be examined very carefully um, I don't think there's anything very rational about it Although I will say this, and I, sh I should have said it in, in the talk, if we come back to um, this question of inspiration, I think you would almost certainly find that anybody in the game um, would say that inspiration is merely a question of putting one foot in front of the other in a reasonably rational way, finding the obvious solution to a problem that nobody else sees as obvious because they don't really know what the problem was in the first place. But for the individual, the problem is obvious and the solution is obvious and everybody else says that's inspired. Hmm? So no, it's all highly personal, very little of it is rational. Hmm?